Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Yesterday, in my view, one of the darkest days in the history of our nation. An unprecedented assault on our democracy. An assault literally on the citadel of liberty in the United States Capitol itself. President-elect Joe Biden reflecting on yesterday's events when a violent mob of pro-Trump supporters seized the United States Capitol as members of Congress sought to ratify the Electoral College vote cementing Biden's victory. Some wearing body armor, pushing past barricades, making it all the way to the Senate floor and even House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's office leaving behind a wake of destruction. Four people as a result of yesterday's mayhem died, and now critics in both political parties are accusing President Trump of inciting the rioters, some even calling for Trump to be removed from office. But was yesterday's chaos a one-off incident, the culmination of mounting tension, perhaps stoked by the president, or is this the new normal? And how does having pro-Trump supporters storm the Capitol affect the future of the GOP? Garrett Berger talked with local Republicans about what comes next. Republican consultant Tom Marks doesn't hold back in his condemnation of the mob that stormed the Capitol Wednesday. It's reprehensible. I mean, it's, uh, it's domestic terrorism. Any Republican, myself included, is going to be, um, you know, it is embarrassment when, you know, you can get labeled with that type of uh, um, or part of a group that engages in that in that sort of activity. But he points to the reaction of people like Congressman Chip Roy or Congressman Dan Crenshaw rather than the rioters as to how the Republican Party will change going forward. For, for some of those folks to break breaks right away and say, you know, we are not going to stand that, you know, we're not going to stand for this. Um, I think that was the very beginning of, of how it's going to change. Marks thinks there will be a more hyper local focus, pointing to how many people have wanted to be involved. All politics became local dur during the pandemic. The local angle is certainly what Bear County Republican Party Chairman John Austin plans to focus on. We think that the mayor overstepped his uh, power to do the lockdown so hard and then pulling the fast one on that. Um, um, curfew over Thanksgiving and pointing to the more than 300,000 Bear County voters who cast ballots for President Trump in November. He doesn't expect their support to waver from Trump. I think people can see really the full, you know, the past four years of, of President Trump has been really good for the country in general. Only the next election will tell. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. The Washington Post reporting the top federal prosecutor in the nation's capital isn't ruling out investigating President Trump's role in what the country witnessed yesterday. Acting U.S. Attorney Michael Sherwood is quoted as saying his office will be looking at possible criminal charges against, quote, all actors, end quote, whether they were there or not. Jesse Degoyata reports that may be welcome news to supporters of Black Lives Matter who believe it was a classic example of white privilege in action. <laughs> As if seeing mobs descend on the U.S. Capitol, walk freely through its hallowed halls, and seemingly take over its seats of power wasn't all horrifying enough. The police literally let these people in to riot and loot at our nation's capital. A founder of radical registrars, Valerie Reifert says she even saw a video on Twitter that has now gone viral. The police officers taking selfies with these treasonous rioters. Last summer, National Guard stood armed and ready to protect the Lincoln Memorial during peaceful Black Lives Matter protests. Yet only Capitol Police stood between enraged Trump protesters and what's considered the cradle of democracy. It was really disappointing to see um, the double standard play out, you know, with the way that things happened um, at a national monument. As Black Lives Matter protests spread around the country, the president had threatened to send in the National Guard. Yet numerous reports say he reportedly was reluctant to deploy them here. The Guard was actually sent in by Vice President Pence and not by President Trump. Quite frankly, we have a president that has invited domestic terrorism into our country. Among the reasons, he says, why the NAACP wants to see the president impeached. What they say became all too glaringly obvious had these been people of color. What we would have saw was a bloody Wednesday. We still live in a society in which we are treated unequally based on the color of our skins. What happened at the Capitol yesterday made us only more aware of the validity and the work that we do. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. 
A Bear County Sheriff's Lieutenant who posted photos of herself at Wednesday's deadly riot at the U.S. Capitol could soon be out of a job. Roxanne Mathai, an eight-year veteran of the agency, wrote on Facebook that yesterday was one of the best days of her life. Alongside photos, she posted of rioters scaling scaffolding outside the Capitol. Mathai wrote that she did not go past the steps of the building because she did not want to be arrested. Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar called the posts and photos, quote, infuriating and said his administration has been in contact with Washington, D.C. law enforcement and the FBI. More than 50 police officers were injured and four people died during that riot, including a woman shot by police after she tried to climb through a smashed window. Salazar said his intention is to terminate Mathai. At this point, I don't care what people say. Uh, I'm going to handle my discipline in this agency uh, as I see fit. Mathai has not set foot inside the jail since October when she was placed on administrative leave after allegations surfaced that she had an inappropriate relationship with an inmate. And new at six, while jury selection on hold in the capital murder trial of Otis McCain, who's facing execution in the murder of a San Antonio Police Department detective, the number of executions in the state of Texas is actually trending downward. Death penalty opponents say the numbers last year, the lowest since 1996. Paul Venema with what they're saying about those numbers and the impact they say COVID-19 has had on death penalty executions. Three people were executed here in the Texas death chamber in 2020, and juries imposed the death penalty in only two cases. In 2015, Mark Gonzalez, who was sentenced to death for the 2011 ambush slaying of Sheriff's Deputy Kenneth Van, was one of only two death penalty sentences imposed in Bear County since 2009. I think Bear County is really emblematic of this shift, both in terms of the jury rejections of the death penalty and prosecutors and a prosecutor who's been who's moving the county away from it. Though Bear County District Attorney Joe Gonzalez is seeking the death penalty for Otis McCain, who is accused in the execution-style slaying of veteran SAPD Detective Ben Marconi in 2016, Gonzalez said that execution is only for the worst of the worst. District Attorney Joe Gonzalez, you know, is part of um, the wave of what we consider reform-oriented prosecutors who have pledged to be more limited in their use of the death penalty. As for the low execution numbers last year. Do you think that uh, COVID actually played a role in this or is there a growing attitude against the death penalty? I believe that both of those things are true. Uh, use of the death penalty in Texas has declined significantly over the last two decades. When the Texas legislature convenes next week, they'll have two death penalty abolition cases that have been filed for them to consider. Paul Venema, Case at 12 News. Turning now to other top stories, San Antonio police believe a man who was found dead just north of downtown overnight may have been hit by a train. Officers found the 62-year-old man in the 1300 block of West Martin Street. That's near train tracks just behind Haven for Hope, the homeless shelter. Investigators think that he was possibly hit around 4 a.m. They tell us they're looking over surveillance video to figure out exactly what happened. The San Antonio police also investigating the shooting death of 25-year-old Gilbert Rocha. According to Crime Stoppers, he was shot and killed back in November of 2016 at the corner of Hebner and Military. Police say Rocha is sitting in the back seat of an SUV when another car pulled up and a passenger in that car opened fire. If you have any information which could help solve this case, you're asked to call Crime Stoppers at 224-STOP. And also tonight, we have learned the name of a man police say was shot and killed on the city's east side Monday night. That man, 51-year-old Dietrich Van Harrington Jr., was found with several gunshot wounds to the chest near the intersection of Ferris Avenue and Beulah Street. He was rushed to the hospital where he later died. So far, it is unclear what led up to this shooting. No arrests have been made, nor have police issued any suspect description. A time saver traffic right now. Let's go to I-10 and Callahan. Good news out here. Traffic moving along very smoothly. I believe that's some road construction that you're seeing kind of off to the side there with the flashing lights. This is the eastbound lanes of I-10 at Callahan. Take a look outside with live cam this evening. Pretty picture. A little cooler out there as well. We got some 
big changes, cooler temperatures. How about that mountain cedar? What's the status on oh, that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Meyer, glad you mentioned it. We have the cedar breeze in effect today. You uh. noticed it. That, this is a gusty northwesterly wind today. It was mild temperature-wise, mid-60s, but the northwesterly wind typically doesn't do us any favors with the mountain cedar count, and today was no exception to that. Very high with a count of 19,000, so very similar to yesterday. Mold, however, on the low end. Our wind really has pumped the brakes quite a bit. However, it is still northerly, and that northerly component I do think will keep our mountain cedar count elevated. So it's north at five miles per hour right now in San Antonio. Elsewhere, generally our winds are between about two and six miles per hour, some locations calm, but it's going to be a northerly breeze, even if it's light, for the next several days. So that probably will keep that mountain cedar count elevated. 58 now in Bandera, Tarpley as well. 63, Castroville, Rio Medina at 60. Get up to Canyon Lake and New Braunfels, it's 58, along with Stinson on the south side of San Antonio. For the most part, we're in the 60s right now, but good radiational cooling this evening because of the clear sky, calmer wind, and very dry air that's in place. Dew points down in the 20s. So air temperatures will be falling down, I think into the 40s by 9, 10 p.m. And then by tomorrow morning, we'll start the day around freezing in the hill country, but mid 30 San Antonio. We'll be back to talk about our good chance of rain coming right up. Pauline Bridger, and this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight, uh, a little dip in our numbers, but still troubling given the last few days of data. There were 1,170 new more, excuse me, 1,170 more cases of COVID-19 in our community since yesterday. Our seven-day rolling average is now 1,534. Sadly, there are nine new deaths to report tonight. Six Hispanic males in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, a white female in her 80s, two Hispanic females in their 60s and 70s. Our hearts are with their friends and families tonight. Uh, we've lost uh, loved ones who are very close to us, and I'm sure uh, many of you have as well. So please keep uh, friends and family and neighbors in your prayers this evening. Our hospital numbers also continue to climb. There are now 1,376 COVID-19 patients in our local hospitals. There were also 207 new admissions, a record high for new COVID admissions in a 24-hour period in our area. 394 patients are in the ICU and 214 are on ventilators. All those numbers are up from yesterday. Uh, I also want to just say thank you to our, uh, our friends and community members in the Defense Department over at BAMSU who have been seeing trauma patients. We're going to hear from them tomorrow, uh, but I do want to thank uh, our Defense Department community, our military neighbors, uh, for all the work they're doing to keep us safe here in the community. Let me turn it over now to Commissioner Rodriguez. Great. Thank you, Mayor. And, and just uh, in case people were not listening, um, one of those records we don't want to hit, I'll repeat what the mayor mentioned, a new a high in hospitalizations, um, another 207, uh, underscoring again how uh, severe this situation is and, and you know, the stress level on our hospitals now at that, um, that high level um, trending towards severe. So we need to make sure folks are aware of that. Um, and, and they continue to mask up and not social distance. Um, a couple just quick notes on vaccinations. I know um, I get quite a bit of calls uh, about vaccinations. We know that UHS, University Health, has uh, an ongoing um, vaccination uh, drive going on at Wonderland Mall. Those uh, slots have been filled all the way through next week. Um, I did talk to George Hernandez today. They are hoping to get some additional uh, vaccination uh, doses in the next week or so. But for now, those are all filled. Um, I did do a Q&A today with the Gonzaba Medical Group. Um, if you are a patient of the Gonzaba Medical Group, uh, that, that's going to be going on their social media tomorrow. They will be reaching out to their patients um, of Gonzaba Medical Group about the availability of vaccinations through them. And I know we're all um, awaiting more direction from the state. You know, with th those are coming down through the state. We're hopeful that uh, there's some additional opportunities for the COVID vaccine. But for now, just be patient, continue to mask up, and, and be safe out there. 
Thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. And, and thank you to everyone out there who has been paying attention to the health guidance and continuing to wear a mask and practice physical distancing. That is definitely making a difference. Despite these numbers, uh, which are incredible and, and very discouraging, uh, we are encouraged by the fact there are so many neighbors that are, are doing their part to protect lives, their own, their family members, and our community. So thank you for that. Also want to remind you that there is still a blood shortage in our community. And if you are able to, uh, the blood bank <laughs> needs your donation. You can schedule an appointment by visiting SouthTexasBlood.org. There is particularly a short So after a couple of days with new cases over 2,000 on a daily basis, it's down to still high, 1,170. The rolling average of seven days, seven day, 24 hour average, 1,534. Nine new deaths have been confirmed today. That's to 1,587 total in Bear County. And we did hit a record today in terms of hospitalizations. The number of people hospitalized right now with COVID-19, that number stands at 1,376 COVID-19 patients, 207 people uh, admitted to the hospital with that illness over the last 24 hours. That is also a 24 hour uh, admission record. Uh, we're going to talk to Dr. Ruth Bergren coming up a little bit later in this show about what's going on in the hospitals and the capacity that we're dealing with here locally. Uh, but that is certainly a really big threat when it comes to the stress that our hospitals and our healthcare system is currently under. Yeah, also going to talk to the doctor about the vaccines and some of the myths that are out there when it comes to the vaccine. By the way, it's a vaccine that's very much in demand. The University Health System says that their appointment slots are filled through next week for people that want to get the vaccine and they are waiting more shipments. They hope next week that will come. And of course, that comes from the federal government through the state of Texas. Let's take a look now at the weather situation outside. A little bit cooler. It was a beautiful day. Just might not feel so great if you're out there with the cedar. Yeah. 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 It's, I felt it. Yeah. yeah well, okay. yeah, yeah. And I mean, I know a lot of folks, uh, even family members, who will be outside alone and will mask up because they're just used to having masks and just one little layer of protection against ah. the cedar. I mean, it's not an N95, it's not perfect, but it's, I guess, something. better than nothing. Yeah, it's something. So that's uh, one tip for you. Just keep the mask on. Let's talk about our weather pattern, though. We have the exiting storm system that brought us a little bit of rain yesterday morning. It's nicely wound up now, crossing the Mississippi with some good moisture. For us, it was too little too late. It strengthened right when it moved past us. Well, we're looking at this ripple in the upper level flow that's just west of the Pacific Northwest. So it's still way offshore, has a lot of real estate to cover before it makes it here to South Texas. But what we're anticipating from this is a cold, rainy Sunday. The next couple of days, Friday, Saturday, we'll have some sunshine into Sunday. That's when we're expecting the rain to move into town, most of it being along and especially east of I-35. But one of the keys here is that by Sunday afternoon or evening, we could have a wintry mix in the hill country. Right now, it's look, it looks like the potential for rain, to light rain snow mix to maybe a little bit of just wet snow on the backside, but very different setup than what we had about a week ago when the snow was piling up in parts of the hill country. So right now it looks like it would be very minimal impact if there is even a wintry mix there in the hill country. Rainfall wise about a half inch to an inch in and around San Antonio, higher accumulations closer to the coastline. Tomorrow sunny 35 in the morning. 60 in the afternoon, down in the 50s on Saturday, and 40s with that rain on Sunday. All right, thanks, Adam. All right, why does it seem every other game, Larry, the Spurs are playing the Lakers? I know, right? Two, well, they played them back to back. Back to back, and now tonight again, yeah. they close out the regular season series against the Lakers. Oh, so, they, yeah, they That's get the good. champs out of the way early on in the season. You know, Jakob Pertl started when LaMarcus was uh, out with a knee injury, well, now he's back to the bench, and that's okay with Patty Mills. Plus, Kellen Mond, he's leaving Aggieland for the NFL. Coming up. Try to cool off the Lakers tonight in their third and final matchup of the regular season. The Lakers have won four in a row and at six and two are tied for first in the West with the Phoenix Suns. The Spurs are coming off a win Tuesday night, 116-113 at the Clippers and sit 11th in the Western Conference, two and a half games out of first place. That game two nights ago marked the return of big man Lamarcus Aldridge, who missed the Spurs three previous games while dealing with a sore left knee. His return to the starting lineup means center Jakob Perto went back to the second unit with Patty Mills. 
got a, a nice little relationship with Yuck. Um, feel like I, I have a good feel for his game. He has a good feel for my game. Um, being able to play together is is huge out there. So um, again, it's 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 all just trying to you know um, feed off each other's energy and um, and you know get used to playing with each other and, and that connection that me and Yuck have um, you know is pretty cool. So the more reps we get under our belt, I think the better we'll um, the better we'll get as well. Rookie Devin Vassell is having a solid season, averaging 4.8 points in 16 minutes per game. He's shooting 42.3% overall, nearly 55% from three-point range. He's played in six games this season and suffered his only DNP in Derek White's regular season debut on January 1st against the Lakers. Derek is out with a toe injury, so Vassell is back in the rotation, and he was first off the bench versus the Clippers. Well, first off, it's just a blessing to be here. Um, yeah. the second, you know, being able to, you know, kind of be a professional. You got to go in every day knowing, you know, there's great guys ahead of you and just trying to be ready whenever your number is called. You got to go in and practice. You got to get extra shots. You got to get extra reps. Um, and that's kind of what I've been doing. That's exactly what I've been doing. So, um, like I said, just being able to be ready when my number is called. And, you know, for today, um, it was great. And it's going to keep happening during the season um, just like that. The Lakers host the Spurs tonight at 9 from the Staples Center in Los Angeles. Orange Bowl champion quarterback Kellen Mond is bypassing his extra year of eligibility and entering the 2021 NFL Draft. He made the announcement this morning on Twitter. The senior from San Antonio had the option to return for another season because the NCAA isn't counting the 2020 campaign against eligibility due to the COVID-19 pandemic. After leading the Aggies to a 9-1 season and a 41-27 victory in the Orange Bowl against North Carolina, Mond was asked what he's the most proud of in his development and player with the Aggies. I think just uh, my demeanor, um, just uh, cool, calm, collected, and, you know, poise, um, the ability to keep composure through, you know, all adversity. And, you know, I've, I've been battle tested, you know, pretty much my whole entire career. And um, I mean, I've been I've been through a lot and, you know, I gave my heart and soul to this university for four years. And um, I mean, it's been a tremendous ride. Some say Mon is a mid round draft prospect, though in November, CBS draft analyst Chris Trapasso projected Mon could go as high as number 18 in the first round to the Chicago Bears. Mon will look to improve his draft stock in the Reese's Senior Bowl Saturday, January 30th, 1 30 local time. So best of luck to Kellen Mond. Absolutely. Yep. Tough decision, but it's been made. Absolutely. Thanks, Larry. You got it. Still to come here on the News at 6, we're once again taking your questions about COVID-19, especially the vaccine, to infectious disease Dr. Ruth Berggren from UT Health. Our KSAC Q&A, up next. You know, we have a lot of viewer questions about the COVID-19 vaccine, the myths that are out there. So well, let's try and separate some of the fact from the fiction like we like to do with our next guest, Dr. Ruth Bergeron with the Long School of Medicine from UT Health San Antonio, an infectious disease doctor. Doctor, always great to see you. I, first, I want to start off with the fact I, I saw on your Twitter feed the other day that you had received the second dose of the vaccine. How did it go? Any surprises? Yes, um, actually, it was a very happy day for me. It was no big deal at all. And um, I guess the main surprise was that my arm didn't seem to hurt and I didn't seem to feel anything. And I started saying, oh, no, did I get a bad batch of vaccine because I'm not feeling anything? However, 24 hours later, I felt very achy and um, the achiness was actually a relief to me because I realized that's the vaccine doing its job. My immune system is waking up and all I had to do was take one Tylenol one time and I drank some tea, went to bed early, and next day I was fine. I worked today and um, I'm feeling perfect. We're glad you're vaccinated, glad to hear you're feeling well after that. We've gotten a lot of viewer questions about the vaccine, as Steve mentioned. Uh, this first one kind of plays into to that uh, vaccination process. This person asks, I received my vaccine on Wednesday. After my second vaccine, how soon will I be able to get together with my family without worrying about getting the virus? Okay, so to get to the 
chance of protection, it needs to be one week after your second dose of vaccine. And remember that it's not a 100%, it's 95%. So you will be pr in pretty good shape um, after that, after a week after your second dose. Next question has to do, and we've been getting this one a lot too, what are the details regarding the vaccine for women who are pregnant? Should they get the vaccine? Is this something that should be recommended by their doctor? Pregnant women can get the vaccine and so can women who are breastfeeding their babies. We do recommend that every woman discuss this with their doctor. It is best to have an individualized conversation with your doctor about it, but there should be no barrier for a pregnant woman or a woman who's breastfeeding to get the vaccine. Is there any stage during pregnancy where it's recommended more than not, or can you get it at any point during your pregnancy? That is a discussion to have with the doctor. Okay. Um, if there's any, cons any hesitation, it, uh, a person who's hesitant may wanna wait until after the first trimester, but this is an individualized decision to be made with the doctor's advice. Next question, can I receive the vaccine in any Texas county or only in the county in which I reside? Any county. Yeah, if you can get it, get it. Right. Yeah. All right, so uh, this is a question for somebody who is in that 1B category. This person said, my husband and I are both in 1B, over 65. My concern is the long lines. We've seen those here locally. Uh, this person said they both have difficulty standing for extended periods. What's being offered to those that fit into that category? Right, so um, I suppose it's dependent on the site. I would like to tell you that the sites that we are seeing at UT Health and what I just heard from a 1B patient of mine who just came back from the university hospital immunization that was going on at Wonderland Mall, that they were not waiting in line and there was not a long line. Now, one, if you think there's gonna be a line where you're going, you could bring a, direct, a collapsible chair and be kind of prepared for it. But ideally, these lines are supposed to be moving very quickly. The processes are, are pretty efficient. Other options that you have include getting it in your doctor's office. So some clinical providers are actually providing them when people come to a doctor visit. That's not widespread yet, but we have been encouraging everybody who's a clinical provider to apply to become a vaccine administration site. So if you want to get it through that mechanism, you may just have to wait until your doctor's site um, becomes an actual vaccine provider. And here's a final option for, you, for everyone to consider. And that is that just today, UT Health launched a clinical vaccine trial. And this is the Novavax trial, where uh, it's a different platform than the mRNA vaccine. You wouldn't know whether you're getting vaccine or placebo, but there's a two to one chance in this trial because of the way that it's designed, there's a two to one chance that you would get vaccine rather than placebo. So that's that's an option that we're not necessarily saying we want it to go to 1B patients, but that's an option for everybody. I know there are a lot of concerns coming into this that people just wouldn't want to get vaccinated for various reasons, that trust is something that has to be built. Are you also concerned that there's going to be a frustration for people who just can't get it yet and they may just give up? Of course, but I think I, I would come back and say, uh, the alternative uh, is not very pretty. And I've just been rounding in the hospital today. Unfortunately, over a several hour period, I heard several code calls for respiratory arrests that were coming from the COVID floors. People die from this disease. And so I, I think that vaccine hesitant people um, really need to take a look at the bigger picture. And I think it's far more scary to think about getting COVID and having the consequences um, than it is to, to get a vaccine. Absolutely. We hate to hear about that situation that you described, but I'm glad you did because that's something I hoped we would talk about what you are seeing in the hospital right now, what patients who were hospitalized at incredibly high numbers are going through in our community. Dr. Ruth Bergren, as always, thanks so much for your time. We'll be right back.
As we've reported, four people are dead following yesterday's violence in Washington, D.C. Three of those due to medical incidents and one woman was shot by police. Critics in both political parties are now accusing President Trump of inciting those rioters and now growing calls for Trump to be removed from office, even with just under two weeks left in his term. ABC's Andrew Dimbert is in Washington with the aftermath. After a night of lawlessness in the nation's capital, the White House finally responds, but taking no questions or acknowledging any responsibility. We condemn it, the president and this administration, in the strongest possible terms. On Wednesday, what was supposed to be a purely ceremonial process, a joint session of Congress was marred by a violent pro-Trump mob who stormed the Capitol. Following President Trump's speech, repeating his false claims of voter fraud, the violent extremists followed his instructions. We're gonna walk down to the Capitol. The rioters, some described as domestic terrorists, breaching barricades with ease, even appearing to get help from and taking selfies with some Capitol police officers. President-elect Biden blasting Trump and the angry mob that seized the Capitol, but also the law enforcement response. Don't dare call them protesters. They were a riotous mob. The Trump fanatics confronting police inside the halls of Congress, some waving Confederate flags, one even making it to Speaker Nancy Pelosi's office. Vice President Pence and other lawmakers whisked away by security, others left hiding in closets and under desks. It's wrong and we've got to rebuild our nation. The attempted takeover taking a deadly turn. Four people died, three from medical emergencies, and one woman was shot and killed by police after she was allegedly part of the mob trying to force their way into the House chamber. Police also recovering two working pipe bombs at the Republican and Democratic Party headquarters, later safely detonating them. After the dust settled on one of democracy's darkest days, a bipartisan group of congressional leaders blaming one person for inciting the chaos, Donald Trump. The president caused this. The president is unfit and the president is unwell. And now growing calls from leaders from both parties to Good invoke afternoon. the 25th Amendment to remove Trump from office just 13 days before his term expires. A very dangerous person who should not continue in office. And now sources tell ABC News President Trump has suggested to advisors that he wants to grant himself a pardon before he leaves office. Now, although there is some ambiguity to the law, most legal experts and constitutional lawyers say a president cannot pardon himself. Andrew Dimbert, ABC News, Washington. Take a look outside with live cam right now. 58 degrees out there. We got some changes headed this way. Hopefully, if you like winter, it's something you're waiting for. <laughs> you, you know, it's Thursday, right? Yes, it is. All right. Let's see. That too. Thermometer Thursday. I'm sorry That's I right. didn't mention it. Found another ornament I can give away. <laughs> ah, there you All go. Right. I bet a lot of trees are still up. Well, no, that's you'll enjoy it for Christmases to come. That's the key. Okay, there you we'll go. See, it's my, like a my tree is still up, Kathy. There you go. Right. See, okay. it's a surprise uh, Christmas gift. You know, a late one, a surprise one. 58 degrees right now, and we'll be in the 40s by about 9, 10 p.m. And then tomorrow morning, starting the day in the 30s. So a chill in the air, but a good rain right around the corner. We're going to talk about that coming up. So we have some breaking news just moments ago. President Donald Trump releasing a video calling for unity in the country and also apparently conceding to President-elect Joe Biden. This is something official that we have not heard from him since the election. Uh, there is that video that Steve mentioned. We're going to try to see if it's available uh, to, to share with you, but we're working on that as we speak. But again, uh, the president conceding in an official video and calling uh, for that calm after yesterday's chaos. All right, let's flip over to Adam Kasky right now and talk about Thermometer Thursday. And, you know, what did you find that in your, in your you know, cushion near your couch or something, that extra <laughs> thermometer. I mean, how does it just like turn up? Well, actually, we took down the tree that we had here in the Weather Center, and uh, that was a spare, I realized. Uh, that was okay, one I had right. accounted for to give away, and then it just sat there, and I made a ton more. And so, surprise, <laughs> here we are. And I'm going to show you a very uh, inventive way to use koozies, can koozies, very oh. special can koozies with Thermometer Thursday. But we've got some weather to talk about here. Not as windy. The wind has really pumped the brakes, so it's not as gusty out there right now. Much needed rain right around the corner. We're expecting it on Sunday. 
Saturday is the outside day. Sunday is going to be an inside day, and we could actually have a little bit of a wintry mix in parts of the hill country on the back side of that system. So let's talk about it right now. Clear over Texas. Cool out there. Temperatures falling into the 30s later tonight. We'll have a hill country freeze. There is some snow in the midsection of the country. That's with the exiting system that gave us a little shot of rain early yesterday morning. But we're looking at this ripple in the upper level flow that's west of the Pacific Northwest. So it's still over the Pacific Ocean. It has a long ways to go before it makes it here to San Antonio and it's going to modify itself quite a bit that upper disturbance as it moves our way. So there's of course some uncertainty in the forecast, particularly in terms of the details and specifics such as rainfall accumulations and even that potential transition to snow in the hill country. So let's talk about it right now. Next couple of days, sunshine. More of the same, but temperatures will be on the downswing. Then we get into Sunday and we'll start to have the rain filling in. Even first thing Sunday morning, we'll probably have areas of rain and the showers coming and going throughout the day. And at times we could have some moderate showers embedded within the action. The trick is by Sunday afternoon, or evening, we could have that transition to a rain snow mix in parts of the hill country, not necessarily all the hill country. If you're in the hill country, it doesn't mean you're going to get some of that snowfall. Uh, we're thinking right now mainly the northern portions of the hill country, and I think this computer model does a good job handling it in particular. That's the way it stands right now, and it's a very different setup than what we had about a week ago, that last event. So we're not anticipating really accumulations with this, just a minimal impact situation and more like white rain falling from the sky. That would be the impact of it, but that of course can change. So we'll keep you updated for the folks in the hill country around San Antonio looking like snow. I mean, looking like rain. Oh. That was close. You know what I want it to be. You know what I want it to be, but it's not. No, sorry kids looking like rain rain in San Antonio, cold rain. As for accumulations right now, best estimate is around a half inch to an inch for Bear County and then higher accumulations closer to the coastline. And the reason for that is that it's going to brew up a separate system and we'll see a little intensification there along the Gulf Coast. We need the rain. I like to see the potential because the newest drought monitor is in and yeah, it's a little bit of an improvement across the state, but not so much here in South Texas. We still have the extreme drought, Northern Bear County, Bandera, and then basically Uvalde, Sabinal, La Prior areas, Carrizo Springs. So we need more drought relief and this will be a drought denting type of system. We're expecting Sunday 58 right now that temps falling fast, dry air, dew point at 24. So dry air in place, still 64 degrees in Del Rio, but that's going to change quickly down to 44 now in Fredericksburg. And as I mentioned before, uh, the hill country freeze likely tonight in San Antonio, probably just a few degrees above freezing tomorrow morning at 35, but a sunny day and right near 60 for the high temperature and not as gusty out there. So it may actually feel a little more pleasant than what we had today. Some fog Saturday morning, and I want to point out if you're in the hill country Saturday morning, you could have some freezing fog, which can disrupt travel. So something to keep in mind in the hill country Saturday morning, then Sunday, a cold rain in the 40s. Look at that. Ooh, I love that music. What you don't see when when we when you, that music is playing is me back here kicking to it. You know, it's good. <laughs> Ooh, it's good. I love to hear that. All right, so I do have a, a winner and then I have my inventive way to uh, use koozies, which may be appropriate for some folks in the hill country on Sunday and would have worked last week as well. All right, thermometer ornament winner, dun, 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 Harry Lovejoy of San Antonio, the Harry Lovejoy. Oh, I just uh, sent an email to So I know, sorry, Christmas is over this year, but surprise, a late Christmas gift for you and you can enjoy it for Christmases to come. And it doesn't have to just be Christmas while it's out. I mean, I'll throw that out there as well. It's, <laughs> it's really the gift that keeps on giving. It Always is. Does. It, it keeps telling, too. It tells you what the temperature is. But these ornaments are meant for indoors. I have to point that out, and I do in my emails. All right. You know how I have some Thermometer Thursday <laughs> koozies? Well, meet Clover. Okay, this is a golden retriever. My nice. brother's up in Minnesota, and my brother's wife was very inventive during their last snowfall. Oh, what a handy use. She's like, oh, we've got so many of these stinking koozies. I finally found a good use for them. There you go, to cover the paws of the pets walking in the fresh snow. How's that? Snow for shoes for yes. your pet. <laughs> snow koozie shoes, therm thurs. We can yeah. come up with something better. Like it. <laughs> That's cute. Thanks, Adam.
We'll be right back. We're now getting a first look at that video from President Trump that he has just issued moments ago. Yeah, let's listen in to just a little bit of it. My campaign vigorously pursued every legal avenue to contest the election results. My only goal was to ensure the integrity of the vote. In so doing, I was fighting to defend American democracy. I continue to strongly believe that we must reform our election laws to verify the identity and eligibility of all voters and to ensure faith and confidence in all future elections. Now Congress has certified the results. A new administration will be inaugurated on January 20th. My focus now turns to ensuring a smooth, orderly, and seamless transition of power. This moment calls for healing and reconciliation. 2020 has been a challenging time for our people. A menacing pandemic has upended the lives of our citizens, isolated millions in their homes, damaged our economy, and claimed countless lives. Defeating this pandemic and rebuilding the greatest economy on Earth will require all of us working together. It will require a renewed emphasis on the civic values of patriotism, faith, charity, community, and family. We must revitalize the sacred bonds of love and loyalty that bind us together as one national family. To the citizens of our country, serving as your president has been the honor of my lifetime. And to all of my wonderful supporters, I know you are disappointed, but I also want you to know that our incredible journey is only just beginning. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America. That the president. We'll be right back. Thanks for watching the news at six. See you on the night beat at 10.